Now, whenever you are actually designing any kind of a web application service, right? There is something very important that you have to always keep in mind, right? So, while designing web apps, we have to keep two important things in mind. First is platform independence. And the second one is service evolution. Now, what is the meaning of both of these? So when I say that whenever uh, if we are def defining any kind of a web application and platform independence is required, then what do we say is that any client should be able to call your set of APIs or whatever are the set of endpoints that you have exposed, regardless of how internally that API is implemented, right? For example, the backend that we write, that backend might be in Ruby or that backend might be in Python, right? The client should not care about what is the underlying tech stack, what is the underlying OS on which you have actually deployed your server and everything, right? There should be some kind of like a platform independence that actually go on behind the scene that, uh, for example, we might use some standard protocols that doesn't matter what your backend is written in, how, what kind of a OS your backend is deployed in. In order to do the communication, there should be some standard mechanism that you are also going to follow as a backend service. And I am also going to follow as a client service so that we can interact properly. It's kind of like, like in simple terms, if I have to explain this kind of a relationship, let's say you have a client and you have a server. Now let me explain this platform independence in a very simple way. So let's say you are user one and you have a Airtel SIM with a iPhone. Let's say iPhone 14 pro you have, let's say this is user two. This user is having a geo SIM card with a Samsung S23. Okay. Now think about what's going on here. Both of the telecommunication service providers are different. This is Airtel. This is geo. This is iOS. This is Android. Can I say the operating system is absolutely different. Device configurations are definitely absolutely different. And in fact, the telecommunication service provider is absolutely different. Still, if you make a call from Airtel to a geo SIM card or from geo SIM card to Airtel, you are able to talk properly. You can make calls very easily. You can send SMS and everything, right? But how is that? These are two different companies. The SIM cards are working on two different kind of a mobile phones. How is it all working? Let me explain you one more use case. So let's say there is a user one who is a residence of uh, resident of uh, let's say Australia. Okay. And this user one is having an Australian passport. There is a user two who is a citizen of Spain and has got a Spanish passport. Now, can I say that this user too can go to Australia and go on a holiday to Australia and chill around. Similarly, this user one can go to Spain and on some holiday and chill around, right? How are they able to do that? How are they able to do that? These are two different countries. Both the countries have absolutely different laws. They are not the citizen of the corresponding country. Still, they can somehow manage to go to each other's country and spend some time as a let's say holiday let's start with this then we'll come to this and then we'll come to this okay how are they able to do that so there is some global authority which actually thought about the fact that every resident is going to have some kind of a passport right every resident is going to have some kind of a passport this part passport will be issued by the country for which the citizen is like, let's say for user one, Australia or government of Australia will issue a passport for user one and for user two, government of Spain will issue a passport. But having a passport doesn't give you the license to go anyone's country, right? Having the passport doesn't give you the license to go anyone's country because every country has a different passport. So when you have to go to a country, what do you do? You apply for something called as a visa. 
this visa is kind of an application that you raise a request to the let's say you are user one and you raise a request to government of spain that uh, i actually want to uh, explore spain and i want to come to spain this is the reason these are the number of days i will stay for these are my tickets these are my hotel tickets these are my itinerary this is my bank balance all of these details you actually share to the government of spain and then government of spain actually approves let's say they approve your travel so they allocate you a visa which is for a certain time period and then with your passport and the visa you can go passport helps you to identify which country you belong to and the visa help you to identify which country you are allowed to visit which other country apart from your own country you are allowed to visit moral of the story so there is some mechanism that cross continent cross countries has been set up so that people can move freely right independently right it's not like when user one has to go to spain then one spanish spanish policeman is always going to guard user one and stay with user one so that they don't make a mistake or anything they can independently roam around spain and they have to just follow some tourist rules at spain right can i say that what has this mechanism allowed independence cross country independence right that if you are allowed you are if you are following some protocols these are some rules right there are some rules and regulations if you follow all the rules and regulation you can go to each other's country as simple as that can i say that now let's come to this example now let's say you are in india both of these service providers and both of these devices are freely available user one buys this combination user two buys with this combination now they are able to communicate with each other right why because the telecommunication government or the department of telecommunication has actually set up dedicated set of protocols right they have set up dedicated set of protocols both of these services actually are different companies but both of them follow these protocols whenever one connection has to be requested from one user to another user they actually go via this service right some protocol they must have set up right again moral of the story that there is some set of rules and protocols that have been developed in between so that anyone having any kind of a connection is able to communicate to anyone having any kind of a con connection i'll give you one more example okay i'll give you one more example so you must have heard about upi unified payment interface unified payment interface okay i'm uh, all of this story will connect all of this story will connect okay now what happens with unified payment interface is that let's say you have a user one you have a user two okay user one has uh, let's say an application of google pay user 2 has an application phone pay right user 2 user 1 has a bank account in let's say union bank of india union bank of india user 2 has a bank account in access bank now can i say that user 1 from their google pay application having a union bank account of india bank account can pay to somebody having a phone pay account having an access bank account can i say that how is this all of this possible so there is an entity called as again a government semi government kind of entity called as npci which has enabled something called as a upi upi interface what google pay has to do or what phone pay has to do if they want to make payments is that this there are again set of rules and regulations they communicate to this upi interface then UPI interface collects the request from Google Pay, processes that request and forwards it to phone pay. And same thing happens vice versa. When let's say this user two has to pay to user one. So they have their own set of applications and own set of features. But in order to do cross communication, there is some interface that sits between, right? So there's a lot of complex things going on. So GPA also doesn't directly hit the UPI uh, server. They have to actually hit something called as a PSP servers. PSP internally communicate to the NPCI server. Then NPCI uh, communicates to the remitter servers. That, that is, let's say, um, this one. Union Bank of India server then comes back. Then communicates to the PSP of this particular person. Then uh, connect, communicates to phone pay. Also, in between, they also communicate to Access Bank for actually debiting the amount. All of that, these things actually happen. These things are defined with NPCI, right? Moral of the story again, that two different environments altogether are able to communicate. And in all these three situations, what happened? The sole reason of easy communication was standard protocols. Standard protocols means, protocols mean rules. 
that there were some set of standards that were that were uh, set up right if if any application for example let's say let's consider an example of some uh, application like amazon pay amazon pay if they don't want to come to the upi infrastructure it's their choice you can use amazon pay wallet you can pay from amazon pay wallet to another amazon pay wallet now they have in onboarded to upi also i'm just giving an example okay but if you have to use this upi infrastructure you have to directly communicate through the bank accounts and all of these features you have to adhere to all the protocols that has been defined by npci so this is what we call platform independence that any platform is able to communicate to any platform they don't gpay doesn't care about how phone pay's application has been built same thing phone pay doesn't care about where gpay servers are deployed where gpay application has been built right this is these are some of the like real life examples of cross uh, oh, sorry uh, platform independence that two different platforms altogether are able to communicate with each, other, with each other. Same thing we want to do with the client and the server. We don't care about how the server has been implemented. We don't care about who the client is, a mobile app, a web app, an Arduino app, whatever it is, right? There should be some seamless communication mechanism that should be set up. And how do we set up these communication mechanism? Again, by standard protocols, right? So what standard protocols we have? So we set up a TCP connection. Let's say if we want to have a HTTP connection or HTTP request response cycle. So we set up a TCP connection and then all of that thing actually happens, right? So this is one thing that we have to always keep in mind. Then the second thing is service evolution. What is service evolution? Now let's say on the server side, we have made some changes. We like whatever were the algorithms that we wrote, we have made them more efficient. But the thing is that client should not be affected by it. Client should not be affected by it. Whatever client was communicate, communicating through, client should be able to still communicate with that same mechanism. And behind the scenes, whatever maintenance we want to do on the server, we should be able to do that, right? So to adhere to these two things, right? We have, apart from the networking protocols, networking protocols means that client and the server both are going to make kind of like a network communication. So apart from the networking protocols that we have set up in place so that we can access the internet, access the network, access the network pipeline and send packets, collect some data. Apart from that, there are some more protocols or you can say recommendations or rules that have been set up. If you don't want to follow these rules, you are absolutely okay to go forward, right? But if you will follow these rules, then it will come to your benefit, right? So in the year 2000, in the year 2000, Right. There was a guy named as Roy Fielding. This guy actually defined something called as a REST. Right. What REST stands for? Oh, I'll write it like this. Representational State Transfer. Okay representational state transfer right so it's an architectural approach to design scalable and maintainable web services right if you want to develop your web apis right then rest actually provide you a set of recommendations if you don't want to follow these recommendations you are like absolutely good to go don't follow them right nobody is going to like kill you for not following them but if you will follow them then definitely it will come to a lot of benefit for you, right? The best part about REST is that it is independent of any underlying network protocol. So we already know about network protocols, right? TCP, HTTP and all of this stuff. REST is independent of that. Internally, to make two machines communicate over the network, what are you using? It doesn't matter. REST doesn't work on the network layer or I would say the networking stack, for example, your uh, transport layer, application layer. It doesn't care a lot about that networking stack. REST instead works on your code level or you can say your implementation level or your web service level. Right? So that means when I say REST or REST architecture or REST API, it no, does not necessarily mean that we are always talking about HTTP, right? This is something that we have to keep in mind. But, but most of the recommendations that you see about REST, most common ones, right, are considering HTTP. Like they do consider HTTP as kind of like the 
highest priority ones but rest architecture can be clubbed with any other protocol also for example rest architecture can be clubbed with the smtp protocol also nobody is going to kill you for that okay but most of the recommendations that this rest architecture defines is with respect to http only right there are other i would say web architecture mechanisms as well for example something called as grpc right for example in google 99 percent of the time any service communication that we have internally at google happens through grpc now grpc defines its own set of recommendations right if you don't want to follow them don't follow them but if you will follow them it will be a lot of benefit to you same thing for rest if you don't want to follow them don't follow them but if you will follow them they will definitely help you a lot right the best part one of the best part about rest is that it uses standard protocols it defines some standard defines standard protocols right and do not force implementation details okay so rest architecture doesn't force any kind of an implementation like on an implementation level they don't force you anything right they don't say that this is something that you have to do otherwise things will not work on a coding level or an implementation level right this is something that is the best part about rest so in today's particular lecture we are going to focus a lot on rest We'll try to understand what REST is, like how exactly it changed the game altogether. At this point of time, if you will work in any company, 90 to 95% of the company's architecture will be based on REST. So it is going to be extremely important for you to actually understand how exactly recommendations inside REST work. Okay. So now, with respect to REST, now we know that what are REST? REST is a set of recommendations. If you follow them, it's a very it's a good thing to go for. If you don't follow them, still things will work. Now, one very important application of following the conventions of REST, I'll tell you. So, there are frameworks like Django, Rails, right? These are some web frameworks like ExpressJS and everything. They heavily follow REST architecture. If you write application, like in Rails, it is said, if you write application following all the REST architectures properly, whatever Rails recommend, then writing Rails application is very easy and it will do a lot of things automatically for you. But if you don't follow it, then you, you might have to do a lot of things yourself and use case of Rails will be absolutely vanished. For example, in Ruby on Rails, like for very basic level of uh, models and everything, you can generate a lot of code. You can generate a lot of code that will be automatically written for you. It will do basic things like, for example, uh, let's say if you want to create a basic set of APIs using which you can fetch some products, uh, create a new product, delete a product, update a product. Rails will very easily do that for you automatically. There are a set of generators that can actually do that for you. But the moment but the moment you generate some code from Rails, that code will be very tightly coupled with the REST architecture. Right? So there are frameworks that by default support. Apart from that, one more benefit of REST is that REST makes sure that if any client and a server has to communicate, the underlying technology doesn't matter. For example, the client is a browser client and the server is a python server sometimes the server is a golang server sometimes the server is a node.js server doesn't matter if if both of them have to connect over the network if networking network connection is happening then rest doesn't bothers about what tech stack you have actually used underlying okay cool from here only a term comes up called as rest api we already know about apis right if you don't know about api let me explain it to you apis are kind of like application programming interface i guess that's the full form but full form doesn't matter right you can say that if let's say there is a functionality right you built a functionality someone else built a functionality and either you or someone who built that functionality want to expose this functionality to the outer world okay let me give you an example so let's say the people who built chrome right embedded functionality that Using JavaScript, you can manipulate the DOM or you can use the timer inside the browser, things like that. So they actually wrote the code, wrote the functionality and then for making sure that any end user is able to actually use that functionality, they exposed it. How did they expose it? They exposed it in the form of functions that you can directly access via JavaScript. Can I say that? This is an API. API is nothing 
but a layer on the top of your code using which the end users can actually use your code without knowing the internal details. For example, when we use set timeout, we do not care about how that timer has been implemented. We just know how to use it. So API actually helps you to expose a set of functionality to the end user, abstracting out or hiding out the internal details. These APIs can be a form of normal functions. For example, get element by ID is a browser API. You will see a lot of people saying that there are a lot of browser APIs. Can you search for one? Something like this. Apart from this, norm, now this kind of an environment, what happens is the person who is using, for example, JavaScript, the environment who is using the APIs and the environment where the API has been defined, both are in the same place. That is the browser. That is the code has been written in the browser and code is accessed from the browser. So it is easy to access them using two function calls. But now just think about it. Let's say you have a machine where you have written some logic using which people can use a kind of like, let's say, a mutual fund calculator. You have built a mutual fund calculator. People can actually use the algorithm of the mutual fund calculator, but this is in your machine. Now somebody sitting inside US, they want to actually use this mutual fund calculator. So this machine and this machine are two different machines. They are cross continent, so definitely they are not in the same local network, right? So how do they do? They will communicate with each other via internet. They will connect it themselves via internet, set up a TCP connection between them and then request response lifecycle works, right? This is again, what happening is when you have built a, uh, let's say mutual fund calculator, right? This computer on mach on you in the U S doesn't care about how this mutual fund calculator works. All they care about is a layer on the top of this calculator, which tells how to use it, how to use it. This layer is your API layer, right? The API layer defines that how to use something, right? You do not care about the internal part. The API exposes how to use the mutual fund calculator. Doesn't tell you about what's the algorithm behind the mutual fund calculator. Now here in this case, to communicate with these APIs, because they are on a different remote machine, you need network calls. You need network calls. So these are APIs which will be accessed via network call, right? So generally when we talk about REST APIs, we talk about these kind of network based APIs or network based functionalities that somebody has exposed for us, but we need to set up a network connection to communicate to them. I'll give you one more example. During the COVID uh, time, there were a lot of telegram groups which automatically used to populate or, or which automatically used to give you notification that which hospital has which type of max, uh, sorry, vaccine. Paytm was also doing a similar thing that they were uh, pushing notification that new vaccines have been up, upload, uh, like uh, added to this particular hospital in this particular pin code, right? How were they able to do that? So there was something called as a COVID API. Okay. So I'll actually show you. So there was something called as a COVID API that government of India actually exposed. COVID API. Right. All of these uh, telegram bots, all of these, uh, I would say Paytm apps like Paytm were actually communicating with these set of APIs only, right? They were actually communicating with these set of COVID APIs, right? Let me actually show you what they have turned it down or what? So, uh, developers API policy. Okay. Just a second. Okay, so they have hidden this API is what? Um, okay, I'll show you. One second. Okay, so you can see these were the set of APIs. Postman has actually documented them. So you were able to, you can actually generate mobile OTP, then you can get the list of states, list of district, right? And then you can get the uh, uh, vaccination calendar by district, right? All of these things were actually accessible. Now, government of India actually prepared all of that logic and wanted to expose it to the remaining world. But the remaining world is not on the same network or they are not in the same machine, right? They are on a different machine. So to communicate to these kind of functionalities that government of India exposed, they need to make a network API call. So these were network-based APIs. So when we talk about REST APIs, mostly we talk about these network-based APIs.
okay so some functionality that somebody is exposing that rest of the people can actually access this is api so this browser thing was also an api this is also an api now what is rest api so now what rest brings into the plate is that they define a set of standards they define a set of rules that are recommended if you follow them you are good to go if you don't follow them then also things will not break but it will be less readable it will be less recommended so they actually bring in some set of recommendation to write these apis internal logic can be anything but generally the api signature how they are looking how to communicate to them they actually talk more about it so that is what something we are also going to take a very deep dive into so now let's talk about all of these recommendations that these rest apis actually give us okay so first one REST API are designed, REST API are designed around something called as resources. This is a very important term, resources, which are objects, data, or service. that can be accessed by a client and represent some real entity okay so this word resource is very important with respect to rest so what's the first recommendation the first recommendation says that whenever you are building any rest api then your design should be revolving around something called as a resource now what is a resource this is any real life entity of your application it can be some object it can be some kind of a data it can be some kind of a service anything that's a resource for example for example let me uh, give you guys an example if you try to define an e-commerce application right what can be a resource a product can be a resource right because it, that's an actual real life entity altogether product a category can be a resource a category can be a resource right because category is a real life entity that electronics is an actual real life entity that exists there is a set of product that belongs to category electronics users are actual real life entity can i say that so all of these are real life entities so we can qualify product as a resource category as a resource users as a resource and so on so rest api focuses a lot on resources right that what is the data that you are going to store or what is the service that you have right we'll talk about services and everything as well but for the timing you can understand that any real life entity inside your application can be qualified as a resource right okay now the second recommendation is that a resource a resource as an identifier a resource as an ad identifier which is a url that uniquely identifies that resource right that uniquely identify that resource for example Let's say in e-commerce, one more resource can be orders, right? Orders can also be, orders are actual thing, right? When you buy something, that's an actual order, right? So now the second point says that, now you know what is a resource. Now for every resource, you will be having a very specific identifier inside the URL of the request. So every request will be made to some URL, right? For example, if you make an HTTP request, you are going to make it to some route, right? So let's say localhost 3000 slash something. So this URL, this route, is going to contain an identifier to the resource for example you might make a request to localhost 3000 slash orders slash 2 now you can see orders is a resource and it is actually a part of the route so your url so your routes are going to be clubbed off resources right so just to tell you as i mentioned just like rest has some recommendations there are other recommendations as well for example grpc has its own set of recommendations so what grpc says that the urls should not be resource based they should be action based for example let's say you want to create an order to create an order the url will look something like this this will be the url with a post request i'll come to the request http request type 
but in grpc it will not look like this in grpc it will look like slash create order because in grpc we focus more on the action rather than the resource in rest we focus more on the resource okay don't worry if you get confused about grpc don't worry on that just focus on one thing that resource is one of the most important part about the rest architecture and in the url resources are actually the part of the identifier right okay the third recommendation that is given by rest is that to send and receive data we use json okay so json objects are actually used to send and receive data for example in grpc we do not use json grpc does not use json grpc use something called as a protocol buffer right there are other recommendations as well like soap just like rest we have a soap recommendation as well there the transfer of data happens with xml but for our use case for rest the transfer of data happens through json right so whenever you are going to accept some response from the server or send some data to the server they are expected to be around in the json format these are the top 3 recommendations of rest now let's start discussing few more recommendations that rest actually gives to us so if we look at a website like book my show and we have to actually try to figure out what will be the resources in terms of the rest a lot of urls we can actually explore we just did that and if you see this url slash home slash pune now this is a different location right let's say if i do bengaluru here you can see the data on bengaluru will change here that means location is one resource coming up right okay if i click on let's say slash animal so you can see slash movie slash animal and the most probably some unique id to the movie that is coming up here so you can say shows like because apart from movies there can be shows as well like comedy show as well some theater show as well right so there are shows and there are like show is having multiple categories so one show can be a movie as well a show can be a comedy show as well it can be a theater show as well it can be a concert as well if it is a movie then you can see some movie related data is coming up so movie is a resource every movie has a name every movie has a price so on and so forth when you try to book a movie then there is a theater so there should be some kind of a theater resource for example let's say if you do sam bahadur pune movie pune and you can see some kind of unique ids are popping up that is going to represent okay what all theaters you have for pune now if you click here right you are trying to now fetch the seat layout of that particular hall that you had right this is the seat layout then when you actually pay then there will be some kind of an order that will be created for you because we are you are going to create a booking so there will be some order resource coming up now every order will be with respect to some user because if you go back there is a proper sign in option so there is one resource on the uh, application called as a user right that's a real life entity you can store it movie is a real life entity theaters are real life entity you will store that data inside your application somewhere location is the data all of these are actually end to end resources right so if we have to actually set up an api a bunch of apis around book my show we should definitely look out for resources like uh, i would say shows then there can be movies allocated to it there can be comedy shows allocated to it one resource will be users right one resource will be location one resource will be let's say payments one resource will be food items for example uh, if you book any show If you book any show for every theater corresponding to it you can see there are some grab a bite coming up that you can actually add so these are also resources right resources like a bite or let's say food item whatever you call it whenever you the moment you add it it will be add, actually added to your overall bill right then once you create an order for every order there will be a ticket right there will be a ticket for every order that what you actually did then there are seats in every movie hall so seats is a resource so all of these are actually resources that you are looking out for right so when you actually talk about the rest architecture then you have to look out for these kind of resources right resources are the one that are going to uh, i would say drive your decisions around making your apis restful so that's why you call it as a restful api because we focus on all the rest conventions so we talked about three conventions that whenever you have to send or receive data you do it in the form of a json if you actually inspect and actually see what kind of a data is actually going on here and there you can see some uh, okay let's not go with these fonts and everything but let's say uh, we add this item okay 
and let's say we click on proceed you can see some kind of a json response is get, getting accessed right so any api request that you will be sending will be having some kind of a json response allocated to it right of course when you are loading a web page you might be load downloading some html css and javascript as well but when you are talking about restful apis two apis are going to communicate if they are restful via json objects altogether right so this is something that you have to look out for and all of these resources you can see are the part of the urls as well the location as i mentioned it's a part of the url i change it to bengaluru things will change to bengaluru now let's we talked about three important things apart from that there are few more important rest conventions that we should technically follow right now generally if you have rest apis working over http http then technically what do we do is we use http methods like get put post delete patch right with our request objects right these methods identify some operations okay so these methods are used to identify some operations right now one thing that you have to uh, keep a note in your mind that let's say let's let me first of all tell you about what operation they identify for example get request identifies that you are trying to fetch some data right post identifies that let's say with any url let's say you are making a http request in that http request you have a url and you have an http method also so along with the url if it's a post request then it signifies that you want to create some data okay delete identifies you want to delete some resource and we should technically name it with respect to resource okay not data but instead we should call it as resource resource patch means you want to update a resource okay and put means you want to override a resource okay now these are recommendations it's not like if you make a get request with a url you cannot create a data for example let's say there is some url like slash products okay and the method http method type is get it's not like if you have a url like slash products and you have a http method like get you cannot create a new product out of it right you cannot create a new product with this http request no you can but you should not because these are the recommended operations right why because now when anybody will actually read the signature of the api anybody will read the contract of the api that okay this kind of url is there it's a get request that means it will immediately strike something in their mind that we are not going to create any kind of a side effect on the server we are most probably fetching some data and that's it that's the only thing that this is going to do and what we are fetching the main resource that we are targeting we are targeting products that means we are trying to fetch some kind of products these are recommendations if you don't want to follow them don't follow them but if let's say you use something like django rails and their inbuilt generators or scaffolding applications then they will the rest api that they will automatically prepare for you will be having these conventions followed very strictly that get request will be definitely fetching some data you can of course override data and update it but by default you will see get request fetching some data post request to create a brand new data delete to delete some data and so on this is something that you have to keep important in your mind that means that these http methods are going to define operations on some resource or signify some operations on resource okay so they signify or define operations on resource okay it's not mandatory that you always follow it but it's definitely recommended that you follow it okay now apart from this rest apis or i would say rest conventions also um recommend one thing that rest rest api should be stateless rest apis 
should be stateless what do i mean by when i say stateless when i say say stateless that then i mean that let's say there are two requests that are coming up then those two requests should not be related every request should be atomic right so let me let me answer it like this for example let's say there is a backend server we hit the backend server and we want to fetch the list of stores that are near my location right so if i am hitting the backend resource from any client from my mobile client or any other user is hitting it does not matter to the backend store or i would say the backend service right it should be stateless that means it should not remember who was the client who made the request what was the last request made because if you have made two requests then it is not the responsibility of these rest conventions or the client to actually maintain all of this that okay what was the last request for example you got five request on your web server right there should not be absolutely any reason that you remember who made the first request what was the first request made for who made the second request what was the second request made for and so on you should not remember that but that might come uh, like a question might come to your mind for example let's say we have to create an order on our backend right so first of all what do we do we fetch the list of products we fetch list of products right among those list of products then we add one product to our cart or let's say to our order you might think that okay we are making a request to fetch the list and we are getting the list of products then we are adding a product to our cart or our order isn't this like one request after another no this is just you made a request you got a response you made a request you got a response now listen to me very carefully in the second request when we are adding to a cart there is no point of remembering that previous request was to fetch the product or previous request was to sign up or do something right if you have to add a product to a cart which product you want to add who is the user you send it in that request and the operation will be done you cannot expect the server that okay hey server please remember that i was the one who actually fetched the list of the products and then if i i if i am sending a product to you that means i want to add it to add it to your cart this kind of a state management the server do not need to know right that's what red rest conventions actually recommend that you do not need to maintain a state you, you should be absolutely stateless two requests should be atomic if let's say you made a request you got a response and this response is required in the next request then you add it in the request object you cannot expect our backend servers to remember that okay this is the response that i sent in the previous request to this particular client and we should use the same data no if client wants to do an operation send that data explicitly altogether this is something that you have to always keep in mind right now apart from this apart from this there is something called as uh, like hypermedia or you call it as uh, hate os right this is also a part of the rest conventions this actually stands for hypermedia as the engine of application state right now what is this hate os actually standing for okay now what it says that or what it signifies that that whenever your client is actually interacting with the server right it should have minimal knowledge about how to interact with the server right for example let's say you got a list of pokemons you are making a pokemon pokedex kind of an application and you made a request to the server server sent you 20 list of pokemons right now technically if you want the next 20 pokemons maybe we can set up some data on the client that okay this was the page number we can store the page number we can store the let's say sequence that what all 20 pokemons we got and then i can send the page number that send me page number two of the 20 list of pokemons and everything this we can do a lot of people do it but there is one convention or i would say one recommendation that client should be uh not uh, i would say having a lot of data about how to exactly interact with the server server should actually help client with that right so let's say whenever you are accessing a web page through a browser users have the ability to interact with the web page by let's say clicking on buttons for example in our pocketx application there will be some button which will be accessing the next page of the 20 list of pokemons right now what we can actually do is in our json response we can actually send a link of previous and next 
that let's say if you want to access the next set of pokemons you can just make a network request to a, this link if you want to say, get previous set of pokemons you can get the network request to this link a lot of apis you will see actually expose this kind of a behavior that if you want to access let's say uh, if you want to interact more with this particular resource for a particular operation they will share you the url in the response object that let's say the next set of pokemons are available on this url just hit that url directly in that case client doesn't have to do a lot of things on its own end right so this is called this is what we call as a hypermedia when you actually have some links or interaction interactability or data that can interact with the server directly from the response of a server so this is a response coming from the server and inside this response you have some more links using which you can interact with the server this is called as the hypermedia links right so rest actually uh what do you say uh you can say that rest actually recommends that you should have this kind of an architecture coming up right so technically what rest overall if i just summarize in two three points said that you should have define one url right then create create routes for resources right create routes for resources use http methods to define operations prefer hypermedia use json for message transfer you can actually avoid the first one okay these are kind of like the bare minimum that actually or you can say summarize that actually rest is actually encouraging you to do now in fact rest also recommends how you should define your urls okay so whatever are your urls should be focused on resources rather than actions right your url should be focused more on the resources rather than the actions or you can say focus on nouns than verbs right so for example if you have a request like api slash v1 slash orders okay other ways api slash v1 slash create hyphen order now this is accepted this is not accepted why because orders is a resource that's a noun so you should use nouns or you should say resources in your urls create order means you are trying to actually define a verb you are trying to define an action defining an action is generally not recommended it's not like you if you will write create order then your application will not work you can make an api naming create order absolutely you can make and it will work like a charm no problem but it will violate the rest convention if anybody else will read your code they might not understand okay creation of order what do you recommend isn't like why do you want to specifically mention create was not this much enough to know that like along with post request if you would have given it this was good enough to know right so how you actually define the urls also is actually very important with respect to rest now one thing to note is that whenever you are defining a resource internally there might be a case that there might be a lot of data stores to actually store the data for example let's say when you talk about orders when you talk about orders right now behind the scenes on the back end maybe you are somewhere storing the details of the order now every order has a lot of products right and a lot of quantity of products so let's say there is one more data store of order item right what is order item let's say one order item has let's say every order has a order id okay and this order item has order id product id and quantity that on this order this particular product is available in this much quantity okay so these two entities together define the order right think about it like this let's say we have a order the order has an id one right and few more details about let's say when the order was created when the updated let's say there are order item 
there is the first order item having order id as 1 product id as 1 quantity as 3 then there is another order item with order id as 2 sorry order id as 1 only for the same order product id as 2 quantity as 10 right so you can see if i have to define one order that hey please define what was the order with id 1 you have to collect the data from this order object and you have to collect the data from all of these order items object where the order id is 1 together they are going to actually represent one order specifically like when all of this club together gives you end to end picture about an order but in the urls you don't have to specifically mention that for this order let's say if i have to see all the orders like all the products of the order i don't have to mention order item specifically you define a uber level resource that okay everything combined is an order order item is an entity inside order the uber level resource is an order so you actually try to focus on that so the resource doesn't have to be in a single data item right it can be distributed internally in multiple data items but when you actually present it to a client you present it like one single entity altogether right you do not have to create apis that represent internal data structures that internally how you have implemented no that's not the agenda you do not have to expose the apis that represent how internally the data is present you have to expose the apis with respect to the fact that how you have defined your resources who what are the real life entities altogether coming up in, in place in your particular application now apart from these there are few more recommendations that uh, rest actually provides these recommendations are around http status codes so if you are working with http apis then every api in their response should send some http status code these status code actually are def definition about the fact that what happened with the request whether the request was successful or the request was not successful what happened with the request for example if you google for md and http status codes right then you can say see there are different type of status codes right it's not mandatory that you always send correct status code you can send always a wrong status code also but again it will violate the convention but it's not going to hamper the application it will not break the application for example whenever you have any success response then you generally send 200 that whatever was the request was successfully completed if you are creating a resource on the back end then 201 created can be something that you can actually share right so this these are something that you have to always keep in mind for example if you try to fetch some data and you are not able to find it right so there are some kind of error responses as well client error and server error client error means that client was trying to find something that is not present so it's the issue of the client that you are trying to find something that was never present so it's a client error whereas let's say client was trying to find something it was present but due to some server issue it was not given so you get a server error code for example you might have heard about this 404 not found that whatever resource you were trying to access server was not able to find it that means there is some problem with your request or let's say 400 bad request bad request means that there is an api there is a contract you are not following that contract for example i was expecting an order id from you but you are not sending the order id in the request that's a bad request that you have not created the request syntax properly that was defined in the contract of the api 401 unauthorized that means you are not authorized to access this particular resource payment required that you have not completed the payment to access the resource so on so these are client issue that who is making the request has some issue whereas you can see a lot of them are there you don't need to use all of them or you don't need all of them every time there are like 10 12 or 7 8 codes that are mostly used for example 500 internal server error now let's say you try to access a resource but let's say the data store where the data is to uh, the data of that resource is stored is actually crashed so it will cause an internal server error that client actually sent the correct request but it was the issue of the server due to which we are not able to cater the request 501 not implemented that okay i have exposed an api but i have not implemented the logic of the api so i will return 501 not implemented and so on you can see some timeout based one are there or there is some infinite loop that is detected by on the back end so these are some status code that actually defined what happened with your request this is something that is uh, pretty much very important to understand right for example let's say if you're making a get request and you found the resource whatever you were trying to search you will get 200 okay if you're not able to find then you will get 404 not found right if let's say 
you were trying to make a get request but and success, request successfully happened but from the server you get an empty response then you can share a uh, uh, sorry success code 204 so there is a 204 code no content let's say you made a request you want trying to fetch some data the request is successful but there is the data is empty that's called as no content so you can show 204 so these HTTP status code can actually help us to identify what happened with this particular request, right? For example, if you have a post request, right? Let's say if you have a post request, post requests are generally used to create a new resource. So if you created a new resource from a post request, you can use 201 created from in the HTTP response, you can send 201 created, right? If let's say the method does some processing, but does not create a new resource, then you can just send 200, right? So that means if the request was successful, 200. If request created something successfully, then 201. Right? This is something that you have to keep in mind. Now, let's say you are trying to, uh, let's say, update a object, right? Let's say you are trying to override an object using a put request. And let's say for some reason you are not able to do it. So there is a error code from the client side called as 409, conflict when request conflict with the current state of the server that you were trying to update something but the current state of the server doesn't support it that's a conflict right so you can see there are different type of error responses that you can actually send in in case of so as i mentioned about different type of requests right so you can actually read about them here as well you can see get and all so i will show you mdn http request type or method type Okay, so you can see all of these methods are actually defined. For example, let's, let's talk about the patch request. So with the patch request, the client sends a set of updates to update an existing resource, right? Now the server processes this patch request and performs the update, right? Now in the patch request, generally you don't need to send all of the data about the object. Whatever you want to update, you just send that, right? This is something that you have to keep in mind. Whereas for put, you replace all current representation of the target resource like you override the resource altogether so you have to keep in mind that what request method you are using what response uh, code you are using all of this actually makes your api better because when somebody will read those api they don't have to read the logic to understand what that api is actually doing also one more thing to make sure that the request and response happens in a particular format so let's say you define the api that the request and response will happen through a json format right so what happens generally in that in the request headers you actually send uh, one header key called as the content type so let's say if the content type you have de decided the contract is based on a json format so you will send the value as application slash json if let's say you decided that you are going to send xml and receive xml so it will be something like application slash XML, right? So these are called as media types. That is actually represent that what kind of a data sharing is actually happening, right? So in case, let's say the API was going to support JSON, but you actually sent XML for that. Also, you have error codes. For example, there is an error code 415. Okay. So uh, there is an error code called as 415. unsupported media type that the data that you requested in the form whatever media format you used is not supported by the server and server is rejecting it that's 415 right this is also something that you can keep in your mind and in fact like how you define like we talked about in a url you should have resources you should have a http request method but now how you define the apis is also very important so generally you define the apis in the form of a crud CRUD is create, read, update, delete. Okay. That any resource might be created with an API or it, the data of that resource might be read. It might be updated or it might be deleted. Okay. So let's say if you want to make a CRUD REST API. Okay. So how the API signature will look like. Okay. So let's say the resource is something like this. Okay, so let's say we have a resource like slash orders. Okay, now generally it is recommended that in your URL, whenever you are using the resources, you mention them as plural. 
it is a recommended format whenever you will see correct form of http requests then you will see plural uh, i would say resources resources should be always mentioned as plural okay cool now if you have a request url like slash orders and let's say it's a post request that means you are creating order creating a new order okay but if it is a get request that means you want to fetch all the orders okay and in a get request if you are creating an order nobody is going to kill you but if somebody will read your api that okay there is a slash orders api you are making a post request to it that means you want to create a new order if you are making a get request to it that means you want to fetch all the orders it's a recommended way okay if it is a delete request then delete all orders right then let's say if it is a put request then bulk override of orders okay now let's say if you have something like slash orders slash 22 right and it's a post request okay then generally you will throw an error that for a post request it doesn't make sense to have an or service like this but let's say in a post request of slash order slash 22 you return the details of the order with order id 22 it's not going to break the application but it's recommended that you throw the error but if you make a get request then you get details about order id 22 the order with the id 22 you're going to share details about that if it is a delete request then you delete order with id 22 for a put request or let's say a patch request then correspondingly you want to update the order with the id 22 now you might be thinking that if you want to update the order with the id 22 how should we send what to update let's say i want to change some order items for example i want to change some products in the order where should we send so for a put and a patch request the data should be sent inside a request body that what to update should be sent inside a request body right this is something that you have to keep in mind here also you might be thinking we okay we will hit slash orders if we hit up with a post post request then we create a new order but how do we send what is the details of the order that i want to store all these details will be sent inside request body okay when we are fetching all the orders then we don't need to send some data when i'm fetching an order with id 22 then the data is already in the url params but what to send to create something what to send to update something this data will be inside request body right so generally in your url params right these are generally to identify resource right that which resource we are talking about request body is to send details of some request right this is not for any kind of an identification these are generally for some kind of an identification that which order i am talking about but here we have to send the details of the order whereas query params if you talk about query params they actually try to represent some configuration for example if you open flipkart.com okay and let's say you put some filter so uh, let's say you put a filter of the price okay if you see the url then there is a query param facet dot price range dot from and facet dot price range dot to so this is representing a configuration on the request that okay i want to filter out the uh, i would say products inside this range so this is a configuration so whenever you have to represent some configuration that's when you actually send a query param so what i want to say here is that how you actually define your url also is kind of like coming from a rest convention post request for example here post request is creating some new resource on the server right it's adding to the new resource sometimes you might use post request to just submit some data but never create something right that can also be done right so you have to always be conscious about the fact that what you what type of resources you are trying to define now sometimes there can be very deep level nesting as well for example we want to do something like slash customers slash 23 slash orders now and let's say it's a get request now what is this representing 
this kind of requ request represent that for customer with id 23 fetch all the orders kind of like this if let's say this would have been a post request then for customer with id 23 we are going to create a new order if let's say it would have been a put or a patch request then customer with id 23 we are going to update its few order for example let's say the url is like this slash customers slash 23 slash orders slash 2 and it's a delete request that means we want to delete order number 2 for customer number 23 something like this right but so if let's say you have two level resource nesting that is also recommended this is like single level resource here you have two level resource that's it that is also recommended but generally very long nesting that you do something like this that slash resource fill then resource id then resource to win then its own id and so on you have a lot of resource nested lot of resource nested inside your url this is generally not recommended this is definitely a lot of times not recommended right why is that because this will make the application too bulky right or i would say the request too bulky most probably this is a say, sign of a bad design that you have not defined your resources well right technically what should happen is if let's say you can distribute them into multiple request if you can distribute them into multiple requests that okay let's first of all fetch this part of the resource then in a separate request fetch this part of the re resource that is recommended but sometimes let's say multiple requests you cannot do because your application is a very high scale application any api request or any http request is a load on the server so you cannot make multiple requests then technically you should design your data in a way that a lot of details can be clubbed together and then sent all together there right so when we will start building the applications it will make more sense to you that what i'm talking about but all of these are like technically good design choices for example at any point of time you have to prepare some kind of a filter then rest recommends to use query params right if you want to prepare any kind of a pagination rest recommends you to use query params right so these are some good recommendations that actually rest generally gives you so there is one of the best articles on the internet about rest apis from microsoft right it's a one of the best articles that you will ever find on rest conventions and like the recommendations that actually rest gives altogether right so you can see restful web design okay they talk about how you should actually uh, what is rest right some basic recommendation you should use json this is how you should use resources right then they talk about uh, what are some good uh, and the bad practices for api designs okay then what each type of request should it technically do some kind of a you can say url examples they have given right so they talk about a lot of things get request what do get request do what do post do what do patch do go through this whole document spend two hours he has a whatever time it takes spend spend some good amount of time in this document for example sometimes you have to send very large data for example so let's say sometimes you have to send a file or sometimes you have to send an image so rest recommends that you do not you should not send the whole image or the whole file which is a very large file all together at once because that can cause network congestion or network latency can be there because it's a very huge data to transfer over the network so you should technically divide them into chunks and technically you should technically send the re range that what range of bytes you are actually expecting right so they talk a lot of a lot about it they talk about how hate os is going to enable you navigation to related resources so let's read about it for example if you want to handle relationship between an order and a customer the representation of the order could include links that identify available operations on the customer for example let's see this is order id 3 product id 2 the quantity of the product is 4 order value is this now there are some links for example we are linking to some customer this is the details of the customer and you have some actions available that's a get request put request pass request like these are some of the operations that you can do on the customer of this order and what is the id of the customer three so they actually give you some hyper media links to actually do some operations so in this example links array has a set of link each link represents an operation on a related entity right 
Now they also talk about something like versioning of RESTful APIs. So why versioning of API is important? This is also something that I uh, wanted to actually cover. So for example, a lot of times in the APIs, you will see something like slash v2 slash v1, right? If you will try to debug Dunzo's network uh, tab, you will see similar kind of a uh, API versioning coming up. Now why API versioning is important? Because let's say if the client has to communicate to the server, right? Let's say client has to communicate to the server. Now let's say that server changes the implementation, right? Server changes the implementation and let's say server has a new set of implementation altogether. Server cannot expect that the new implementation and the new APIs client will immediately just migrate to the new APIs. For example, previously the APIs were looking like slash orders. Now the API looks like slash customer slash customer ID slash orders. So you cannot expect that in a single day client will change all of its implementation altogether. So what you do is you do API versioning that this is V1 API, this is V2 API. Previously client is consuming all of the V1 API. And then you will release a V2 API, but you will still support the version one of an API for backward compatibility. You will say that, Hey client, you have one year till one year. You can use V1 of our API, but we have launched V2 as well. And within one year, you need to migrate to V2. If you will not migrate, then we will immediately stop supporting after one year the v1 so what now client can do is that client can slowly steadily start migration on v2 it will be still having a lot of endpoints working on v1 but v2 will also be enabled right that's why api versioning is important so the simplest approach may be acceptable for some internal apis significant changes could be represented as new resources or new links right so for this you can see what they recommend is something like this. So, uh, URI versioning. Each time you modify the web API or change some schema of the resources, you add a version number in the URI of each resource. So see, V2. Kind of like this versioning you can actually do for your API. Okay. Sometimes you can use query string also for the versioning. This is also something that you can use. A lot of people actually use that as well. You can send the version of the API in your header. So you can define a custom header and in the header, you can send the API version. So like you can see different type of recommendation for different, different steps. You can opt in for that. So I would highly recommend every single person to go through this doc, right? People can actually ask you that what is rest and how do you define restful APIs? I will again specifically focus that rest is not about any forcing or enforcing of any kind of a rule rest defines recommendation to write good api design if you will follow it the api will be better readable it will be better extendable easily migratable easily maintainable and it will be consistent to the rest architecture if you don't want to follow it don't follow it just make sure that you have good documentation on your end so that because now you are not following restful convention. So a lot of things might not be obvious, right? If you follow restful conventions, no, then things are obvious that, okay, this is something that this guy or this girl might be willing to do. This was all about rest, restful APIs and the rest architecture.